And I thank everyone that's here and our host, Tony Annette, and our guest, who we will introduce in a moment. So thank you very much, Tony. This whole series is sponsored by uh, the Gabelli School of Business, the leading people and organizations area in collaboration with the International Humanistic Management Association. So thank you all for coming. Tony. Thank you, Michael. You. Just make sure. Okay, everybody can hear me. Thank you, Michael. My name is, as Michael said, my name is Tony Annette. Um, I work on the intersection of economics and Catholic social teaching. I'm teaching right now at the Gabelli School. I've also written a book called Cathonomics, how Catholic uh, tradition can create a more just economy so you can get that uh, and, and where they sell books but this morning we're here to talk about the economy of Francesco and I have three amazing guests the economy of Francesco if you don't know is an initiative uh, organized by Pope Francis it's about bringing together the young people of the world to create a better global economy more in tune with uh, humanistic values with Catholic social teaching with a new way of structuring the economy that puts people first. But um, a lot of people have been doing a lot of deep thinking about the economy of Francesco, including my three guests this morning. So we're gonna have a, this is gonna be a conversation. I'm not gonna talk very much because we have three amazing guests. Let me introduce them briefly. I won't, I'll just do a very brief introduction because we wanna get immediately into the discussion. Um, let me introduce first Elizabeth Garlow, who is the co-founder of the Francesco Collaborative and a fellow on faith and finance at New America. Previously, she helped lead impact investment for Lumina Foundation, where she invested in early stage ventures focused on education and the future of work. She also served as a policy advisor with the Obama administration's Community Solutions Task Force. Welcome, Elizabeth. I'll let introduce my second guest, which is Felipe Witzger. Felipe co-founded the Francesco Collaborative to weave a network of entrepreneurs, investors, and change makers to build more connective tissue between different parts of the economy of Francesco movement ecology. He serves as a senior consultant to FADICA, helping the Association of Catholic Philanthropies advance their mission-driven investing. He also founded and grew the Community Purchase Alliance Cooperative to $20 million. Welcome, Felipe. Um, my third guest is Sister Sue Ernster. Sister Sue is a vowed member of the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, a religious congregation of Catholic sisters based on, in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Sue currently serves on the elected leadership team as well as serving as congregational treasurer CFO of the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. These, this group is asking themselves how to reckon with earning money at the cost of detriment to others, including Mother Earth. And she's thinking more deeply about what the economy of Francesco means in terms of transforming the economy, working with the solidarity economy. Welcome, Sister Sue. So let me begin at the very big basics. Tell us about the economy of Francesco initiative and what it means to you. What was the catalyst for bringing you all together on this wonderful initiative. Maybe I'll start with you, Elizabeth. Happy to. Um, hello, everyone. It's so nice to be with you. And it's great to be with Tony in conversation as well, because his book that he just released has been just really incredible fertile ground for our community practice Thank to you. wrestle with these uh, topics. So um, just, yeah, so back to the basics. So uh, the catalyst that brought us all together, I think, was this just deep yearning we've all had to bring together kind of a more integral life for ourselves as people who are wrestling with how we do um, financial decision-making, how we do investments, how we think about our participation in the economy more broadly. Felipe and I were part of a prayer group that started pretty spontaneously about three years ago, looking at the intersection of Catholic social teaching and the economy. So probably much like this group here, we were wrestling with questions at kind of a macro theoretical level, as well as a very practical level as we were working in, in the fields of impact investing and cooperative economics. And it was during the time that our prayer group was meeting that Pope Francis wrote this letter in late 2019 to pe people around, young people around the world, where his invitation was to enter into a covenant, what he called a covenant, to change today's economy and give a soul to the economy of tomorrow. And we were struck by these words. We found that the sort of invitation to think deep and 
systemically about the structural problems of the global economy and to integrate those with the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, as he enumerates in Laudato Si, was just kind of resounding within us. And so we all enlisted to go to a CZ to gather with him in 2020. You can imagine what happened then. Um, the gathering didn't happen, but we started convening people online. And Felipe and I put an initial call out and 250 people signed on and we realized, wow, there's a real thirst here to have this kind of shared space for dialogue, also in a somewhat kind of vulnerable and safe way, because many of us feel the cognitive dissonance that comes with saying, wow, we're actors, we're participants in this global economic structure, and we're trying to lead faithful lives, and we're trying to really kind of hearken to the, the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. So um, we started gathering people in 2020, um, and then that has gradually evolved into these workshops, leadership workshops that we now run, which I'm happy to talk about. Tony and Sister Sue has been a participant in those. Um, but we're essentially bringing together um, investors, asset owners, um, particularly those who work within Catholic institutions or have sort of a Catholic lineage that they're seeking to steward in their investment practice. And we provide them with um, a space for peer learning and dialogue, and most importantly, kind of frameworks and tools to help them unleash their, their own most important work in this space. Right, that's amazing. Thanks, Elizabeth. Felipe, how about you? The origin story for me is just the deep ache that I developed um, when I was 22 years old and got my first 401k from a consulting firm that I was a part of. And then I realized my privately held management firm was acquired by a larger company and the CEO laid off um, about 20% of the workforce. And I was the low cost resource. So I was still there on the climate change and clean energy team left with the strategy consulting job of delivering reports to oil and gas and utility executives. And I realized this doesn't make sense. We're an insight and information business, and yet I'm 22. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how the markets and regulations and geopolitics work, but from a you know, management, uh, you know, M&A perspective, it was all about not client satisfaction. It was about quarterly shareholder reports. And I realized it was so important for IHS market at the time to deliver a good small bottom line and good profitability to show the acquisition was successful. And so it, it just kind of drill, drilled home to me later when I realized, oh, I have 60 shares. It's not worth 6,000, it's worth 8,000, it's worth 12,000. And I think seeing how it was hard for me to disentangle my deep frustration with the management of this firm and who I later came to realize are very ethical people, very humanist in their own approach, but because of who they're accountable to helped me see just how insidious some of the capital supremacy structures are in our economy. And that ache and that longing to find a different kind of investment portfolio has led me on this journey to, um, you know, when Elizabeth and we heard this call from Pope Francis to solve the structural problems of the global economy, in direct relationship to the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth, it felt like this is an opportunity to step into the fullness of what I think it means to be Catholic, which is part of this enormous institution of 1.6 billion people. There's a lot of power here. And I think what I got so excited meeting Elizabeth and the other people in our prayer group was, these are folks with ambition, real desire to be the protagonist of transformation that Pope Francis is inviting all of us to be. And when we began to think about who could be that in the world with their asset stewardship, it's women religious that have been consistently over the past 50 years on the front lines of divestment in apartheid, um, community investing, rooted works of mercy. Um, and as we got to know a few of those congregations, it was Sister Sue's story and the congregation that she's a part of that had done some of the most interesting work. And we met her at a key moment that I'm excited to have her maybe share a little bit of her story, her congregation's journey, and how much capital they've deployed in just one year of kind of becoming a, a catalytic impact investor. That's great. Yes, let's, um, since we have so, such a privilege to have Sister Sue with us this morning. So Sister Sue, uh, I'll turn it over to you. How did you come together with this amazing economy of Francesco group? Uh, well, it was as Pope Francis was convening the economy of Francesco in our congregation, we wanted to support the, the movement. We wanted to support the shift of financing for those, for those who are gonna come after us. Because we know that our longevity, our, our median age in our congregation is 82. So we know that we need to start looking further into the future for those that are coming after us and that it isn't only about us. 
And so we participated in some of the workshops or the webinars that were happening. And then when it didn't happen in a CZ, the Elizabeth and Felipe pulled together and offered the workshop. And we had just come into some money as we had divested from one of our sponsored ministries that we had founded. And at our 2018 chapter or gathering of our congregation, we had decided that the money we would receive from that divestment would not be for our needs because we have enough to care for our, our members into the future and meet our mission needs. So we were, we just, our congregation voted and decided that those funds would be used for donations as philanthropy, as well as impact investing, because it would be half and half. We had learned about, we had heard about impact investing and had been doing it for decades in organizations. And we realized it was the time to help shift, realizing that our current system isn't functional any longer, that philanthropy is not the only way and it isn't working to correct the system. You know, we could keep putting the money in, but nothing would change. And so we, we participated in the workshop. A couple of us from the committee participated in the workshop and we decided and took back to the committee the excitement of we've learned that we can really shift the economy, that it isn't only in public equities that, you know, that capitalist system, which we are a part of, and we're using those funds to do the impact investing is a reality that we earn in the stock market. And so we use those funds for the impact investing. And it's in the impact investing where we're seeing, oh, we are able to meet the needs of those that don't have access to help bridge the equity gap. And one of our investing lenses that we're using right now is uh, unveiling our white privilege because in 2018, we passed three areas of movement and one is unveiling our white privilege. And so as we've been looking at the investments we're, we're going to embark in, it's how are we continuing to participate in this huge equity gap between those that do not have access and we who do have the access. And so through the workshop, we've been exposed to cooperatives, the opportunities for employee stock ownership programs that we can help promote. And in the, in the year that we've been participating, we, it was fabulous to be with other investors and share the information rather than holding the information of, oh, we know about this, but we're not gonna share that because we did several diligence calls together of the organizations that we were going to potentially invest in. And we utilized Catholic social teaching principle questions in, at, in vetting each of the managers. Mm -hmm. And they asked, you know, it was, how are you, what's your board makeup? What's your employee makeup? How well are you paying your employees? All of that, as well as how do you, how are the decisions made? How is the common good served? Solidarity. And each of the funds that we've participated in have been able to respond back. It hasn't been a foreign concept to them at all, those questions. And we just had a meeting this week of our investment committee and our seeding a legacy, which is the committee that's been working with the impact investing. And we're asking ourselves the questions, you know, how much is enough for us? What is enough for us? We know we are blessed. We are living in an abundance economy rather than a scarcity. And so how do we share that abundance? And we also participate with shareholder advocacy in engaging, let's say, with Walmart or other publicly traded for systemic change that way. We also see this as 
a fuller integration of our values, especially our Franciscan charism of right relationship with all, because when we have more than somebody else, we're not really in our lens, we're not valuing and treating their inherent dignity the same because they've been denied access that we have. And so part of this shift for us is reawakening to our past and our responsibility. That's great. Thank you, Sister Sue. That's an amazing story. It's so heartening to hear the principles of Catholic social teaching being put into concrete action uh, at this level. Um, let me ask about Elizabeth and Felipe. You've done a lot of work with investors. Um, talk a little bit about what, what you're doing with investors specifically related to the economy of Francesco. Maybe I'll start with Elizabeth again. Sure. Um, well, first, I just want to acknowledge that what Sister Sue just shared, the arc of her story and her journey is sort of deeply emblematic of the, what we're seeking to cultivate with this community of practice, which is the Francesco Collaborative. She is the collaborative. We are all the collaborative. And I think we're trying to journey together to put into practice the depth of Catholic social teaching in, in ways that serve a more just and equitable economy. So um, I guess I'll, I'll speak a little bit to some of the specifics we're, we're currently working, working on with our investor community. So um, Catholic, uh, Sister Sue acknowledged sort of Catholic social teaching principles. So one thing Felipe and I have done is we've gone back to those kind of time-tested principles and we've been seeking to translate them into very practical principles that can be applied in investment um, strategy and decision making. The first is to engage communities in the design, governance, and ownership, um, which really allows for us to recognize the kind of power dynamics that exist as investors and the ways that we structure, um, the ways that we build our theory of change as investors and signal what matters with our investment activity and consequently start to shape the market, um, the ways we structure the investment terms of our deals, whose interests are subordinate to whom, to whose. Um, so that's one, um, and I should acknowledge these principles we've developed in, in partnership with a group called Transform Finance. Um, the second is the idea of adding more value than you extract. So as you're making an investment and you're um, looking at the yields on those investments, who is it yielding a return for? Is it yielding a higher return for the community or for you as an investor? And figuring out ways to really kind of fairly balance risk and return between parties. Um, is another kind of key idea or principle. So we've been taking these principles and we've been creating diligence questionnaires, question, questionnaires for managers as Sister Sue referenced, um, as well as really thinking through like what, what are the real, we, we've started to develop a spectrum um, of investment activity to look at if you're really truly embodying these principles, you might be on this end of the spectrum. And what does that look like? What kinds of investment opportunities are there? Whereas if you're kind of further on the other side and maybe you're participating in more kind of an extractive investment economy, what might that look like? And acknowledging that there are many things in between and that we're all on a journey and we're all trying to figure out how we do sort of faithful portfolio construction in ways that make sense within our context. But ideally that continue to kind of bring us on this journey of, of trying to be more faith first in our approach or kind of Catholic social teaching embodied in our approach. So we've been exploring as an investor community this distinction between something Felipe mentioned at the outset, which is this concept of capital supremacy, which is a, a world in which the interests of capital, everything is subordinate to the interests of capital, to a world of capital reciprocity, where we really examine the ways that capital can be in right relationship with communities and with a broader set of stakeholders that we're seeking to serve. Um, and so because of that, we've been really doing a pretty deep dive on the shared ownership economy as an example of something that's pretty deeply embodied um, in Catholic social teaching principles. And so maybe I'll pause there. Felipe can, can share a little bit more about what that likes, but we've been going deep with a number of enterprises that are seeking to kind of steward um, uh, a shared ownership model. Okay, Felipe, you have a couple of slides to show, so I'll move over to you. 
I think Elizabeth spoke to this well already. I just thought, you know, we would kind of give a quick snapshot on um, some of the Catholic investors that are part of the collaborative already. So you see Sister Sue here representing one religious congregation amongst others. Um, there's also a very large Catholic healthcare associations, Common Spirit, Ascension Investment Management, and the tens of billions asset stewardship, um, Association of Catholic Philanthropies, Catholic Impact Investing Collaborative, and a global network called Faith Invest. Um, but some of, I think, what we're trying to weave together in this economy, Francesco, is people in the popular movements and community organizing, Catholic institutions, you know, the new economy, worker dignity, different sense of ownership and, and governance and leadership structures that exist in business. And I think that you guys steward as a, as a community um, quite well, from my understanding. Um, and we're pointing to these solidarity economy practitioners that we think are in differently structured businesses. Cooperatives, you know, have their stakeholders, whether it's the customers, their producers, their workers in the ownership. Um, or they have them in the governance. Uh, employees, you know, have a different stakeholder firm. And so to kind of help give a sense of that piece, Elizabeth alluded to this spectrum that we have, you know, capital supremacy on the left here, this extractive kind of traditional public and private markets that prioritize financial returns first. And then on the far right, you have, um, you know, moving, uh, moving left to right here, you have this aware and less extractive ESG kind of considerations as part of it. And then impact investing that prioritizes some social impact and then a sustainable investing, which is like this has some flexibility in the returns um, for investors, um, but really prioritizing the social impact first. And the final part, the blue on the right, really is you're prioritizing the community wealth, the community agency, the autonomy of those communities first. It's kind of a sense of the return is in like the balancing of power in a reciprocal relationship. It's a right relationship. Um, and that's the notion that we only get from the notions of distributive justice and solidarity, a structured commitment. So we think solidarity is a structured commitment to neighbor love. And so livable future enterprises are ones that have that structured commitment embodied in some dimension in their management, governance, and ownership. And um, Sister Sue has been one of the most catalytic of investors. So as we think about different types of investors, um, we believe there's a whole spectrum and um, folks that have more flexible capital that can begin deploying these livable future kind of dimensions can anchor pooled capital vehicles that other investors can come alongside. And that's really the theory of change in our community is that um, we can do some of that work together. So I just wanted to share a couple of those pieces and we can come back to other slides of how we've distilled um, some Catholic social teaching principles into action. But maybe just to draw out Sister Sue a little further, Sister Sue, you mentioned unveiling white privilege. Um, you mentioned a little bit of this relationship with indigenous communities. Um, but I was just curious if, if you want to share, you know, you're one of the congregations that had a healthcare asset and you divested from that, that created this additional flow of capital and you've been able to deploy that. And, and because of your work with desire and reparations with this indigenous community that Indian school, there's, um, I feel like your heart and the heart of your congregation has been much more open than I think many investors are. And I think you're helping other investors move along the journey. And I, that's, the, that's the kind of container we're trying to create at the Francesco Collaborative where people that are moved by their social education, the works of mercy, the works of justice in the world can then help other investors develop a more critical analysis of the dominant frameworks in mainstream economics and mainstream finance and see those as fundamentally extractive and then help them move along this journey. Yeah. Sister Sue, you want to take it from there? Sure. So thank you, Felipe, for that. Uh, when I talked about in 2018, we, we had three provocative movements, was unveiling our white privilege, uh, solidarity with um, all suffering of our earth community, and then joyful gospel living. And as Felipe commented, we had divested from one of our medically sponsored institutions. We had started a hospital, we had merged with another entity and then we divested. And those funds were no longer, we realized we do not need for our needs and we're going to share them with others. And as all of this has been happening, we participated in the Economy of Francesco workshops. It's been a real, uh, the spirit has been at work. I will. I can only say that the spirit has been at work. It's not a coincidence that all of this is happening at once. Uh, as also, we started this impact investing journey. We were made aware that um, we knew that we had start. We had a boarding a Native American boarding school in northern Wisconsin, and we had ran it for fifty years, and it. We ceased that in 1969, and 
as part of what is happening in the Native American boarding school movement and that awareness, we are working on how we make reparation and what that looks like for us because of the harm we, we imposed without intending it. We didn't intend to do any harm. And as we look back now, we can see that what the process that was in place did not honor the Native Americans. And so we're in that process of how do we make reparations and how does that influence where we share our impact, use our funds. And as part of this reparation, we're really looking at how are we awake and how welcoming are we of the, those that are not the same as us? Because our congregation is, we're based in the Midwest. We're almost all Caucasian. We do not have much other diversity. Uh, sister Thea Bowman was our first African-American sister in our congregation. There was, it did not go easily for her at times in our congregation when she was a member. And uh, that has brought conversations among us as well, is how open are we? And we are really starting to look at when we make these impact investments, what's our motive? Is it so that we can feel better about what we've done in the past? And to kind of like, I don't want to say pay for our sins, but uh, you know, is it that or is it we really want to develop the relationship and ask ourselves the questions of, are we ready and willing and able to empower others to be where we are? And so I, catalytic seems like a pretty bold term and I'll accept it because I did look at our, the amount of capital we have deployed or taken from the public equity and into the private equity and impact investing. And if our committee approves next week, it would be 5 million from last April until now. And we do have a goal, as I talked with our, our, our other half, um, another partner that I work with, and we're looking at another six to eight investments in this next year, at least, and that we as a congregation are starting to look at, you know, what percentage or of our entire portfolio will we say, we do not need a market-like return on and really embolden those that are living the solidarity economy, the opportunity to, to further enhance that. Great. Thanks, Sister Sue. Again, that's just an incredible story uh, of like, you know, real common good financial stewardship. I want to shift gears just a little. And this is for you, Felipe, because, you know, as you know, there's a strong tradition in Catholic social teaching for worker ownership and worker control of businesses, including through cooperatives, including through things like co-determination where workers uh, have a share in the management of the business. And I know you've done a lot of work on employee ownership and cooperatives. So tell us a little about the landscape of that today and how relevant that is for the economy of Francesco. Thank you, Tony. I think that gets to the heart of what I think Sister Sue's action, she's deployed almost all of these impact investing dollars to differently structured businesses, mostly employee ownership and worker ownership enterprises. And that to me is what makes the big shift. Because when you go to your normal investment advisor, they're not going to have any employee ownership options for you. They're not going to have a cooperative in any option for you. And so it's just basically unintelligible to the conventional finance landscape. Um, but the, the message that I've been surprised to, to learn over the past couple of years is that cooperatives aren't just a fringe small food co-op thing. It's actually embedded for the past hundred years in this country with credit unions, rural electric cooperatives, insurance, agriculture, each of these industries has trillions of dollars of, of banks, uh, of credit infrastructure um, that could be leveraged towards the solidarity economy because they already do have differently structured governance with uh, credit unions, credit union members 
in governance. Now, is that actually economic democracy in action? Certain cases, it's, it's not, right? And rural electric cooperatives. But what has been exciting to me is to appreciate that this isn't um, a minor alternative. For example, multifamily housing, 25% of all multifamily housing units in this country are cooperatively owned. Um, 30% of the land mass in the United States is covered by rural electric cooperatives where the ratepayers are the technical owners of the cooperative entity. Um, in credit unions, 12% of household savings is held in credit unions. So these are not you know, pieces of um, our economy that are totally fringe. And I think what's exciting to me is that um, worker cooperatives, um, well, take a step back. The, 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 the landscape of employee ownership um, there's about 2,000 ESOPs, employee stock owned companies, that in the 70s, a piece of legislation enabled uh, stock ownership. And this might be a lot of trucking companies in the Midwest, grocery stores, Publix is one of these. Um, now, what it offers is ownership, but not any governance or any control, right? So workers have some sense of participating in the upside of the valuation of the firm over time. Now, there's no agency in decision making or management and those kind of things. So mm -hmm. it might not align with the humanistic management frame in many cases. Um, now, worker cooperatives blend both the ownership with that governance and agency and decision making in a firm. And so it has kind of the fullest embodiment of subsidiarity in our, in our kind of nomenclature um, because there is worker run vote. And some of the innovation there is coming from uh, worker owned holding companies. So one of the challenges of worker cooperatives, we only have two or three that are about a thousand people or more in this country. Um, whereas Mondragon, we have hundreds of thousands in other parts of the globe. Um, but in the US, worker cooperatives haven't succeeded at major scale. Um, so Obron is an initiative to have a holding company where the workers of many subsidiary entities hold the overall holding company and participate both in the upside and the governance of an entity like that. So Obron is one example. There's a Main Street cooperative in Phoenix. Each of these are raising capital. One of them has partners with Kaiser Permanente, has already acquired six or seven companies. And so there's a lot of activity happening right now, especially with interest from private equity, surprisingly, um, to say the way you get better productivity out of manufacturing is you give employees some employee ownership and some agency, and you actually teach them the great game of business by giving them a p &L, it looks like a basketball stats, and they learn how they can lower the bottom line and increase the, the top line. And um, overall grow business. So I think from a, there's, there's pressures from both angles. So those on the kind of movements for justice and social movements that are embracing employee ownership, and then even from kind of a very pure free market kind of how do we get more from labor perspective too. And both of those are driving factors of a lot of interest we see in employee ownership where tens of millions are flowing into this ecosystem just in the past two years that wasn't there three years ago. That's a phenomenal story. I'm going to open it up for questions very soon. But let me first uh, ask uh, one more question for the three of you. And, you know, as I listen to this conversation, I realize there's so much great work being done. But at the same time, we need the reality check that the world of contemporary finance is a very different place, where I think shareholder maximization still holds sway, where the Friedman Doctrine, uh, which states that the only, the only social role of business is to maximize profits, is deeply embedded in the financial system. So. What do you, this is a kind of an open-ended question, so you can take it in any direction you like, but what do each of you think needs to change with contemporary finance to build a more moral economy aligned with the economy of Francesco? So maybe I'll go back to you, Elizabeth, on that. Well, that's a pretty complex question, but I can share a little bit about some, some of the things we've been contemplating. So when we're considering our I can jump in there if she's dropped off for a minute. Okay, Elizabeth, you froze. That undergirds okay. a lot of our work with the Institute. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah, you froze for a second, but we can hear you now. Oh, you've frozen again. Maybe Felipe, you jump in while Elizabeth is there. Oh, you're back, Elizabeth. Sorry about that. <laughs> Impeccable timing. Um, uh, I was mentioning, so the theory of change that undergirds a lot of our work, we've We've drawn um, inspiration from a group called the INE Institute on that. We can drop that in the, the chat here. But in part, it looks at um, multiple levers for system change. One is to seek pathways to really oh. best. No, hold on. Go ahead, Tony. You can jump to Felipe. I'll try to fix my connectivity. Okay, Felipe, you want to jump in? Yeah, the theory of change she was talking about was um, 
a little chart we'll put up in a second. But another piece that we go as a starting point is you said, you know, shareholder supremacy, Friedman doctrine, what I think of is just neoclassical economics. And I think you lay this out beautifully in your book, but I think too few of us in society at large appreciate the economic theory underpinnings, um, all of the teaching around economics. And so we're myopic, we're autistic in our only coming back to one frame of reference instead of recognizing the rich schools of thought in political economy, whether it's from feminist or Marxist or institutional or Polanyi, wherever you want to draw, there's so much rich thought and analysis philosophically that can undergird why neoclassical focuses on a reductionist a way to map onto kind of like physics description of the economy versus um, an over-determination kind of philosophy that might say many factors are always at work determining so much. And so we try to help people recognize that we need to go back to first principles here. And I think our Catholic social tradition, drawing on Bruni and Zamagni, we have civil economy to draw on here. And we have so much that we need to kind of paradigmatically um, help ourselves get unstuck. And so that's the first thing we do with our workshops is we need to reawaken to how economic theory has become so myopic. And then we need to develop our own critique of how, from economic theory, finance has become myopic on one view of how we need to benefit all through that shareholder primacy view. And I think what's interesting is when you look at just pragmatic, the business roundtable today, Doug McMillan, Walmart CEO, he says, we need stakeholder capitalism, right? We need mm -hmm. multiple stakeholders relevant. I think even the best business minds today recognize exclusively focused on shareholders has not serving them. It is not going to serve them long term. So even in their interests, we're having a clear wake up moment from, I think the mainstream black rocks of the world, their recent shareholder letter, everyone recognizes their environmental and social questions that have to be wrestled with. I think what we try to offer our cohort and what we try to use the Francesco paradigm to say is we can let the dominant powers that be frame this conversation, or we as the people of the world can frame the conversation as protagonists in each of our own spheres. And collectively, there are tens of thousands of young people that have joined this economy of Francesco movement. To, to me, they're the leaders of the next couple of decades. What we need to do is equip them with a richer theological, philosophical, economic, political economy tradition so they know they can contribute to reshaping the ideas that are in circulation that then influence the next couple of generations of policy and integration. I think you've, Thank you've hit on something really important there, Felipe. It's the way we teach economics and finance. And that's why I'm very, I'm proud to be part of this, um, this Jesuit reformulation of business and economics teaching. That's why I'm teaching at Fordham this semester to try and teach economics differently. This neoclassical paradigm, as you've mentioned, the reduction into an individualistic utility maximizer and a firm as a profit maximizer has been awful for for society and for humanistic values. We need, we, need to ch we need change from the bottom up. So that's why education is so important. Uh, Elizabeth, are you back? Yeah, I was just gonna add to this to say, I think this is part of why Pope Francis has called us to be protagonists of information, of information, of transformation. He uses really bold language. And in part, I think it's because it, it does require quite a bit of courage and conviction to break from path dependencies. And we have a lot of path dependencies in our current economy and our current conventional financial system. So we believe that part of this kind of work that we're trying to do in our communities of practice is create the conditions for personal transformation, because you have to find that inner conviction. You have to cultivate that moral center from which you might actually break from that path dependency, that you might take an alternative action and consequently illustrate what is possible. And so I think the congregations that we're working with like Sister Sue's are lighthousing alternative possibilities, which really does start to awaken people's eyes to like, wow, there are multiple stakeholders. There are multiple ways of thinking of, about power. There are ways that we can complexify our conventional notions around risk and return in finance. When we're talking about risk, we often default to notions of financial risk, but there, there's planetary risk, there's climate risk, there's community risk. There are, there are many ways that we can start to really interrogate some of the underlying assumptions around that. And when it comes to return, I think what the story Sister Sue shared is so illustrative of how powerful it can be to say, like, what is enough? What is enough for us? What is enough for our community? What is enough for my family? What is it? And that discernment is so critical and so unique in many ways in our current sort of conventional financial management landscape. So we think that the, the sort of richness of our faith tradition offers some really compelling ideas and frameworks for this question of how you create this 
kind of cultivate this moral center that allows you to look at the landscape and ask like, how am I going to be a protagonist of transformation in this system? How can I start to kind of lighthouse different possibilities that embody, truly embody the values that I think um, can be guiding yeah. our culture? Yeah. Sister Sue, you're in the trenches on this. Do you have any views on how, how finance or economics needs to change? I do. I've been thinking about this and it's, and I'll just use the term that we've been using. We who have the capacity and the assets need to utilize our social capital in helping to shift this and utilizing the, yeah, our social capital and our networks to make the awareness known that there are options and there are other options than only the system that we're currently in and that we most of us benefit from. And I, I do think it's in going back to the, in the Acts of the Apostles where they all cared for one another and being reminded that that is where we started and how do we get back to our foundation. And honestly, and I don't mean this to sound as a judgmental comment, if those of a certain age or anyone saw the Catholic teaching, social teaching principles in action, I think there could be a reinvigoration of people interested in the Catholic faith. If they actually saw the teachings in place and in practice, there could be a greater, yeah, embodiment. And so I do think it's the building, growing together and connecting those who are of a like mind to make their voice known rather than individually and together. Because uh, uh, I'm reminded of when uh, we were doing our first diligence call last year with one of the funds that uh, we invested in, there were 10 different organizations on the call and at the end, as we debriefed, we deployed close to $10 million from Catholic asset owners into a fund. And that is really making Catholic social teaching principles known in a broader realm than they would have been otherwise. It's really breaking into other spheres. That's amazing, that's great, yes. Let's, um, we have 15 minutes left. Let's open it up to your questions. So the way we'll do this, if you, if you want to use the raise hand function on the reactions, you raise your hand and I'll call on you. Uh, yes, uh, I see a hand raised from Jared. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I have so many questions, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll boil it down to one. Uh, firstly, thank this is, this is just fantastic. Uh, my question is about uh, the problem that we face, the existential problem that we face in the world today. And in terms of scale, scope, and urgency, uh, the kind of demand that is being placed on us and the kind of impact that we truly need to have from an existential perspective, I mean, leave ideology, leave all that alone, it's just that one question. Uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we grow this? In, in, in a, at a level that will really have a true impact uh, on, 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 our, on our planet today and on, on our society today. Uh, I think that that's the biggest challenge. I think the, the finance industry, for instance, I think is co-opting the message with this noise that they've created around ESG, uh, which has been questioned even by BlackRock's own um, uh, own uh, initial Tariq fancy has called it a placebo. Uh, so, so how, how do we resolve this? How do we, I think that's, that's the question that's really troubling me. I think we, there are lots of wonderful movements that are taking things in the right direction, but in terms of scope, scale, urgency, they don't seem to match the problem proportionally. So Jared has asked a big question. Do we have any answers? Anyone, any, any of the three panelists want to address that? Don't have answers, but I do have um, okay. courage to try to kind of rise the scale, scope, uh, and urgency of the question, um, which to me is that 
to this point of movement ecology Elizabeth was pointing to earlier. Um, I'll pull up a slide here in a second, but there's this little chart. And um, in the chart, slide six of the slides that I mentioned here, let me pull it up one second, because I think it helps you appreciate what we're trying to do. And I think it, to me, it's my best hope, which is that we're trying to create more middleware. So you see here, there's this personal transformation in the top left quadrant, alternatives in the bottom quarter, and then there's changing dominant institutions, which they've broken down into three different pieces. There's inside game, there's structure organizing, and there's mass protest. And many of our social organizations, I think, usually live in one of these domains. Um, our, our vision of the Francesco work is that we're trying to appreciate and value each other's work. So for the Center for Action and Contemplation, they're all about Franciscan spirituality infusing a transformed life, um, right, spiritually. And so that's the personal transformation domain. Um, you might think of the Sunrise Movement as mass protest. How do we have direct action to put the Green New Deal at the front and center of the agenda here? Um, then you might have specialized Catholic action, which labor movements, um, faith-based community organizing and the structure organizing domain. And then there's like the inside game. We need, you know, the American Sustainable Business Council social venture circle to actually have the inside lobbyist game to actually change the SEC rules that open up so much of where capital could flow differently for um, so much. And then you need to all point towards the alternatives. These you know, different stakeholder business, alternative governance, alternative ownership structures, alternative management structures that could reform all of our conventional business. I pointed to um, this MSI integrity group. Amelia Evans grew out of um, 10 years of facilitating multi-stakeholder conversations between different human rights groups, Oxfam, Amnesty, and big corporations that had supply chain challenges and sexual gender-based violence in Southeast Asia, for example. Her realization was after 10 years, they would come to some resolution. The corporation would hammer out their new code of conduct, how they were going to avoid the problem in the future. But two years later, a similar problem grew up somewhere else, right? So her analysis was, this is not fit for purpose in terms of our climate, in terms of our social agenda. And so she's actually trying to engage with, you know, major, all of the major, you know, companies to say, how do we get the human rights community to say, we need to restructure beyond corporations. They're simply not fit for purpose. So that's one example of a hopeful movement that seems to have major power and lots of other ones. And so we're trying to weave some connective tissue relationally between social movements, between alternative practitioners, between structure organizers and say, we need everybody here, but we need to like have some, um, some shared understanding of each other and more middleware such that it's easier for Sister Sue to find 50 alternatives to deploy all of her portfolio and not just Sister Sue, but that leverages the 50 and 100 billion that are exists in Catholic healthcare, that exists in dioceses, that exists in parishes and the Laudato Si action platform is one of those things that we're seeing as a potential vehicle that could do that on many levels. Elizabeth, Sister Sue, you want to jump in? I was going to mention the Laudato Si Action Platform. Maybe mm. I'll pick up there. Um, so this is a seven year journey uh, to mobilize 1.6 billion Catholics around the globe in service of some of the ideas enumerated in Laudato Si. Um, part of why I think we are so eager to bring together this kind of faith tradition with alternative economic organizing and building work is that if you look at the SDGs framework, it's, it's sort of the most commonly referenced framework for impact investing activities. And I spent years working in impact investing in the field of microfinance and in running a, a fund, an early stage venture fund. I didn't see very many people truly move hearts and minds in service of the SDG goals. I just didn't. And I think part of the challenge here is we need to appeal to people's identity, core identity, in terms of affinity for place, affinity for tradition, affinity for community. And that is what we think could allow for that kind of personal transformation, that third of the graph that Felipe showed. Mm. And so how do we make our faith come alive for us in ways that truly answer the call of the structural problems of the global economy that awaken us to the kinds of things that you're talking about, Herad. I mean, it's it's really interesting to me to sort of realize the ways that like these statistics that the UN is putting out around the SDGs, like that's not moving people to really do a, a complete sort of re-examination re -examination of their portfolio. But if you ask people to go deep in a faith tradition that they've been stewarding in their lives or that have been a part of their lives for generations, it might actually awaken sort of hearts and minds differently. So I think there is this kind of, you know, global interest right now. There's a group called Faith Invest, which is seeking to do a multi-faith campaign or effort to mobilize about $6 trillion in assets across faith-based groups globally. 
in service of more humanistic values. I think there are ways we can do this according to affinity for place too, right? And we've seen that on kind of a local level, people sort of stepping into their identity as community members or as citizens. Um, but I think, it, I think it's an interesting question for us, like what really moves us, right? Um, what, what's going to kind of lead to the change of hearts and minds that we need? And before we go to the next question, I just want to check, do Sister Sue, do you have anything to add to this? I just wanted to comment to Gerard's question. I think it can, it's overwhelming. I honestly, when we first started in the Academy of Francesco workshop, it was the information and the possibilities were overwhelming and we had to take our part, what we could do and do that. And so I don't think we can all do everything, but we take one part and we move with that. What I, and we have signed on to the Laudato Si action platform and it is very holistic because it isn't only looking at economics, it's looking at how do we engage in how we eat and where our food comes from and how much electricity do we use, all of that. So it isn't a one spoke of the wheel, it's the entire wheel that we look at. And so it's, my, it's not only, oh, this is what we do with our economics, how does that in, impact everything else? Excellent. Um, we have another question from Roland. Go ahead, Roland. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Roland from Mannheim, uh, Germany. And uh, one question, if I understand Catholic social teaching, what I have learned, it is uh, focusing more on the institution than on the individual. And we are talking about billions of Catholics individuals. But there was a slide right now from the Aini Institute, transforming dominant institutions. And I like this, but I think this is a very heavy task. And how do we shoulder to transform dominant institutions? And that's my question. Okay. Anybody want to take that on? I think, um, Roland, we're, we're animated by that similar question of not just institutions, but the systems that are informing institutions and that the institutions are forming. And I think you're right that Catholic social teaching sort of emerged in a unique moment, but while society was transitioning from a largely agrarian system to a more industrial system. And it awakened all sorts of questions about what is fair work? What are the kinds of workplaces we're seeking um, to cultivate? What is in keeping with these concepts or ideas around human dignity? We see a lot of those questions being just as relevant, if not more relevant today um, in the context of the, the sort of many intersecting crises that we're grappling with. So I don't know, Felipe, if you want to pull up maybe just the, do you have um, the, the Catholic social teaching slide? We can just give you a taste of how we're thinking about um, uh, applying some of these concepts or ideas. So you'll see, you know, our kind of core um, Catholic social teaching principles here that we continually refer to. And then this, we offer these principles for bold integration of these ideas into your organizations. And you'll see those here on, on the right side, those, those four principles. So again, it does bring to light questions around how are you structuring power and governance within your organizations? How are you doing kind of particip deep participatory work? Who are you bringing into your processes, your decision-making processes? And how then are you embracing this kind of multi-stakeholder approach? And then we, we've developed this kind of this diligence questionnaire that we're iterating on, but just to give you a taste of what does it mean to take these Catholic social teaching principles and put them into practice. We've been surprised by the number of people who have come into this dialogue with us about Catholic social teaching who have actually no connection to Catholicism, who have said these principles resonate. And I actually wanna figure out how I apply them in my, my own context. There's a group called Adesina Social Capital, which is developing kind of an alternative index to really center communities of color and their interest in the capital markets. And they're trying now to take Catholic social teaching principles and build a kind of an alternative evaluation framework within their organization. So I think there's some universality to these principles, um, mm. but you know, that's, we could continue talking about that for a long time. And Tony, you, you yourself have a lot of yes. thoughts on that, I know. Well, you know, that, that's precisely the reason why I wrote this book because I think that if you want to redesign the global economy, 
the principles of Catholic social teaching offer a ready-made set of rules and guideposts to do that. And I think uh, Felipe's slides show brilliantly what, uh, what those principles are and what they mean. Um, but this is hard because I think there's, I find there's, there's some opposition. Um, so uh, like people think the word Catholic, they don't really know much about Catholic social teaching but a lot of people are turned off by religion. So they think it's like religious things. I think Sister Sue is right. I think the more Catholics know about Catholic social teaching, the more they will love the Catholic faith. But I think, you know, in my view, as we face a bit of an uphill battle among some constituencies. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to follow up on that um, or if anybody has another question. We have like three minutes left. Just wanted to appreciate Roland. And I think if you want to talk more, the changing dominant institutions question is core to the heart of our, of my deepest desire and ache. And the questions we bring to this work is how do we do that? And I think, how can we each be agents, but how collectively can we build power? And I think in faith-based community organizing, whether it's PICO, Gamaliel, IAF, there's lots of networks that are kind of come all from Catholic lineages and the specialized Catholic action and the Cardine movements. We believe there is a power analysis that we can all get sharper at and understanding how organizations change, how institutions change. And that's something we're always reflecting on together. Yeah. Sister Sue, do you want to talk about this? Since you're, not, you're actually a religious sister who have views on this, I know. Uh, yes. And actually, I am, through LCWR, having conversations with other leaders of religious congregations about, I'll say, deploying assets in a, in a different manner, utilizing Catholic social teaching. And it is with those who are younger than a certain age that are more receptive to it because of their life experience and their the, just because of life experience. So I think that it's taking it one step at a time and finding others that you know have that interest and in working together rather than trying to do it all separately and thinking I have, I, cause I know we as a congregation don't have all the answers. We're used to having all the answers and doing it all by ourselves. And I think more women religious are at the point of, we can no longer do this. We need mm. outside assistance because women religious in the United States are looking to how to pass on their legacies as more congregations come to, I'll say fulfillment. And our, our numbers are not the same as they were. And so how to pass on the legacy and the charism and still have mission. And so there is this discussion happening about how do we pool our assets for impact? Thanks. We're, we're almost out of time. Thank you, Sister Sue. That was uh, an excellent answer. Um, but there's one more question from Gabriel's. Maybe we'll take Gabriel's question and then we close it out. Thanks. Thanks. I, uh, um, I do need to bolt for another meeting here, but the, the question was if people could in one click in their 401k account or their brokerage account, uh, choose a nonprofit uh, that they believe would uh, voice their values, if they could delegate all of their proxy votes to a nonprofit that would represent their values in corporate governance, um, would people want that would nonprofits be willing to stand up and uh, take stewardship of the for-profit public sector? And if so, which nonprofits and uh, who wants to help me build it? Anyone, <laughs> I got right. Uh, <laughs> anyone, anyone they want to take that? Quickly, anybody want to take Sister that Sue's on the board of Seven Generation Inter Interfaith, which is one of these groups, I think about six or seven that are the leading ones in the faith community. Um, but as you so, I think is very interested in this. I think ICCR, Scorch Responsibility, ISJ, Courtney Wicks, brand new executive director there. She's part of a workshop. These are huge questions. I think a lot of the Catholic philanthropies we work with are trying to figure out how more of their portfolios can be proxy voted too. And I think your retail strategy to everybody, I think you're absolutely right. So um, definitely let's, let's talk more. Okay, Phil, okay. reaching out on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Okay, we've, we're at 12.01. I want to be respectful of people's times. I know everybody here is very busy. So we're going to close now. So just uh, join me in thanking Elizabeth, Felipe, and Sister Sue for uh, an extremely rich and wonderful discussion over the last hour. So thank you all.
And with Thank that, you. with that, I bid you uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Um, and thank, thank you. Thank you, all. Tony and Michael. Really appreciate you. Appreciate, appreciate you. Thank you very much. Okay.